Lord of Mysteries 2, Circle of Inevitability. Chapter 311, Strange Boy. Lenberg, Baron Brignize's illegitimate son or godchild resides in Lenberg. Lumian was puzzled, his mind racing with playful guesses. Baron Brignize places a high value on education, entrusting his most beloved child to the kingdom of the god of knowledge and wisdom for learning. Lumian studied the young lad before him and asked in a laid-back tone, Aren't you supposed to be hitting the books in Lenberg at your age? The education there is leagues ahead of what Trier offers. The boy's face lit up with an oddly animated expression. Nah, I'm not up for the daily grind of school, burning the midnight oil over homework and tackling exams every month. Sounds a little terrifying. A shiver trickled down Lumian's spine at the thought of such a life. At the very least, it didn't sit right with him. Agreeing with a nod, Lumian casually asked, Are live rats tasty? The boy regained his composure. It's not exactly gourmet, but I can't be choosy when hunger gnaws. Waiting till midday to raid the kitchen doesn't cut it. True bliss is savoring a meal whipped up by a maestro chef, and some mild hunger pangs do add a certain flair. After explaining, he must have felt he came across too mature and quickly recalibrated. Can't blame me if your kitchen's dragging its feet until noon. Well, that's hardly the point now, is it? When I was wandering about without a proper place to stay, I sure as heck didn't have any notions of munching on live rats. The big issue, of course, was that I couldn't even catch the pesky things, and if by some miracle I did, then I had to somehow figure out how to set up a fire, skin them, and roast them. But this kid right here, he's out here grabbing rats, using nothing but his own bare hands. His strength or maybe just his good luck isn't half bad, I'll give him that. It's not even an hour away from noon, and he's acting like he's got an insatiable hunger? The more Lumian looked at him, the more he was convinced there was something peculiar about this little lad. Amused, he inquired, Brignize didn't bother to feed you then, need me to escort you to the police headquarters so you can lodge a complaint about his child abuse? Well, aside from pestering me about my studies, he's all right. He makes sure I have a proper meal every two hours. On top of that, he whips up cakes, biscuits, roasted meat, and pies for those midnight hunger pangs. A subtle lick of the lips revealed the boy's longing. Are you a pig? Lumian had never eaten so much while undergoing puberty. And yet, the lad didn't appear overweight, only solidly built. In the blink of an eye, the boy's gaze shifted as he spoke in rapid succession. Perhaps studying demands a lot of energy. I need all this sustenance to keep my brain firing on all cylinders. Is there no saying about how, trying to explain is just a cover-up in Lindbergh's education? Your elaborate justification makes me wonder if your appetite is problematic. All this eating hasn't exactly made you a genius, has it? Lumian grinned and quipped, If Brignais wasn't intentionally starving you, why resort to raw rats and steak? In a frustrated tone, the boy retorted, I managed to slip away without breakfast or morning tea today. And yet, you're so famished that you're downing raw rats. If you go hungry for another half day or so, will you start eyeing pedestrians on the street? With a fluid motion, Lumian produced an iron-gray military flask from his shirt pocket. His left hand slid into his trouser pocket, deftly unscrewing the cap of the flask before tucking it away. Lumian raised the iron-gray metal flask, breathing in the fragrance with a satisfied grin. He inquired, his voice light, Fancy a sip? Gulp! The boy's Adam's apple bobbed as he swallowed his saliva. Struggling, he responded, I'm not of age yet, I'm just a kid. He's tasted it before, and he's taken a liking to it. Lumian passed his judgment and swallowed a mouthful of the spirit. Maintaining the military flask at his lips, he spoke in a casual tone, a question hanging in the air, Which deity do you believe in? Why are you asking? The boy inquired cautiously. Seeing the lack of alarm, Lumian breathed a sigh of relief. He tipped the flask again, the liquid gurgling. He lowered the military flask, his expression bright as he spoke with clarity, as a devout follower of the god of steam and machinery, I've got to verify the faith of those with uncertain origins. 
by steam. This time, Lumian spoke without the veil of alcohol. Subconsciously, the boy shook his head. Words don't mean much. Just saying I believe in whichever deity doesn't make it true. Lumian studied the boy's reaction. It's true that folks from the Orthodox churches can sometimes claim belief in any deity without much sincerity, but they're harmless. I'm more concerned about worshippers of evil gods. They're fervent and unpredictable. They won't fake it to deceive others, believing that to be against their faith and blasphemous. Instinctively, the boy retorted, Not always. Some followers of evil gods will pose as adherents of the Orthodox gods to further their holy missions. They can pray, attend rituals, join mass, and chant the names of other gods without a second thought as long as they repent to their own deity afterward, they reckon there's no issue. At that moment, the young lad abruptly halted. He exchanged gazes with Lumian and lapsed into a prolonged silence. After a spell, he took a bite out of his uncooked steak and introduced himself, I'm a believer of the God of knowledge and wisdom. The devoted faithful in our church have this peculiar knack for pointing out slip-ups in the other party's speech, just like before. Yep, just like before. Lumian fixed a piercing gaze on the lad for a few beats before inquiring, what might be the usual prayers at the God of Knowledge and Wisdom Church? Quick as a flash, the boy responded. Like I was saying earlier, folks who believe in those evil gods can mutter the honorific name of an orthodox god with a heavy heart and toss out those prayers. You can't rightly figure out what's in others' minds unless you're a card-carrying member of the eternal blazing sun church and you've got it notarized that you won't lie. I think you should take a look at. With that, the lad clammed up once more, his gaze fixed vacantly on Lumian. After a brief pause, he stretched out his empty right hand and pressed it to his forehead. May wisdom be with you. Such a foolish fellow shouldn't be a spy sent by an evil god. From his intelligence, he's really a child. Lumian struggled to maintain his composure, requiring a concealed deep breath to regain control over his facial muscles. Indeed, he concurred, his lips curving into a smile. Mirroring the boy's action, he brushed his head with the base of the iron-gray military flask and uttered with significance, May wisdom be with you. Without affording the boy a chance to reply, Lumian adopted an alluring tone. Would you care to join me at the café on the second floor? I'll treat you to a proper meal. The chefs here are quite remarkable. The boy swallowed visibly. You won't turn against me, will you? You can tail me the entire time. That way, I won't ever get a shot at double-crossing you. Lumian initiated a little trial, testing if the other guy's brains matched his looks and age, or maybe they lagged behind. And mind you, we only prohibit the God of Knowledge and Wisdom Church from preaching in Intis or setting up a cathedral. We do let their believers cross the border. Triers got the Lenberg Chamber of Commerce, you see. The boy pondered for a moment and said, Okay. Lumian sized him up, withdrew his left hand, sealed the liquor flask, and tucked the iron-gray flask back in his brown coat. Then he pressed his forehead again. May wisdom be with you. With that, Lumian pivoted and ascended the stairs. The kid stuck to him, politely shutting the cellar's deep brown door behind him. Seeing Lumian whirl around, the kid explained earnestly, if it's left open, the food inside will spoil. True enough. Lumian pulled his gaze and climbed up the stairs. The kid trailed him close, eyes peeled for any odd moves, any signs of betrayal. Lumian steered him into the kitchen, then upstairs to the cafe on the second floor and ordered a set meal. In no time, the spread hit the table. Fried veal steak, grilled eel, roasted leg of lamb, chicken pie, red wine, and cream. Lumian settled in, watching the kid wolfing down like he was bottomless. Every now and then, he tossed a comment. Veal is crisped good, but the meat is nothing special. Sweet sauce masks the eel's fishiness, but it makes it greasy. Leg of lamb is roasted just right, crispy outside, tender inside. Spices are off a touch, though. Too much fennel. Just eat. Why are you so talkative? Lumian silently watched the boy eat the table full of food with a satisfied expression. 
Fifteen minutes later, Baron Brignise walked in from the second floor entrance, donning a half-top hat with a diamond ring shining. The boy turned in surprise and glanced back at Lumian. Lumian smiled and said, Did you think I'm the only one here who knows you? The boy was startled as he fell silent. Baron Brignise walked up to Lumian and said with unconcealed relaxation, Appreciate it, seal. Just so happened to catch him skulking around in the cellar, munching on something, Lumian responded, his voice warm and friendly. Baron Brignise gave him a sidelong glance before shifting his attention to the boy. Time to head back, Ludwig. Ludwig, the young boy, remained silent. Swiftly, he polished off the last remnants of his meal and rose from his seat. Seal will catch up, Baron Brignise directed a nod at Lumian. Seated opposite, Lumian observed as Baron Brignise clasped Ludwig's hand, their departure imminent. Lumian's lips curved again before saying, Don't forget to settle the tab. Baron Brignise displayed a hint of surprise. His eyes flickered, suggesting a momentary uncertainty in his initial assessment. Yet without uttering a word, he withdrew a wallet brimming with banknotes and promptly covered the cost of Ludwig's meal. Lumian maintained a contemplative silence, watching the duo disappear down the stairwell. Leaning back in his chair, he murmured softly, his voice a mere whisper, Temeboros, where exactly is the stroke of fate you mentioned? Chapter 312 Hint Though Lumian maintained a cautious skepticism toward Temeboros, his curiosity about the enigmatic stroke of fate continued to gnaw at him. The way Termiboros had alluded to the earth blood ore as an encounter had caught his attention. Could this time involve Ludwig, the young boy? There was something off about this fellow, something amiss. Yet as their conversation unfolded, Lumian came to acknowledge Ludwig's intelligence, origins and apparent devotion to the god of knowledge and wisdom. Despite this interaction, Lumian found himself gaining no true insights or foresight. It was unlike his understanding of the earth blood ore's potential, which hinged on specific conditions of going underground, finding the right area to encounter something. Once again, Termiboros's powerful voice reverberated through Lumion. The moment will reveal itself. Can't you people make yourself clear? Lumion's frustration surged, his blood boiling in his veins. I'm unlike what you consider people, Termiboros responded, straightforwardly. I'm a mythical creature. Lumian was left speechless, taken aback. He forced a scoff and retorted, I doubt even your sealed form can truly grasp fate's threads. Each time, your answers are mired in vagueness. What sets you apart from amateurs in the divination club? If you possess the power, reveal clearly where my next opportunity lies. Termiboros responded with a deep tone, Tonight, at 11 p.m., Risk Docks, Warehouse 3. Huh? Surprise coursed through Lumian. Termiboros's hint was unexpected. Yet, within his astonishment, puzzlement persisted. Inevitability Angel is that kind. As a high-ranking alms monk, he shouldn't have been provoked so easily to interpret my fate. Could there be an ulterior motive? Regardless, I'll consult Madame Magician's insight first. Lumian decided swiftly. He rose, departed Sal de Balbrise, and embarked on a journey to Rue das Blouse's Blanches. Executing a simple act of arson, he could initiate the initial potion digestion step and contemplate gaining a contracty boon. Despite his anxiety, Lumian refused to lower his guard against Termiboros. Within Rue des Blouse's Blanches in the safe house. Lumian meticulously documented the particulars regarding Ludwig and Termiboros's clue. Subsequently, he conducted a ritual, summoning the doll-like messenger. As Lumian awaited Madame Magician's response, he delved into a trove of information concerning spirit world creatures. Reading the descriptions of certain knowledge consumed a substantial amount of his spirituality. Some even induced dizziness, nausea, frustration, headache, a burning sensation, and illusions. Similar to Aurora's grimoire's portrayal of profound knowledge about deities and high-level creatures, this information is fraught with intense corruption and perilous ramifications. If all the knowledge that pursues humans bear such attributes, it's genuinely chilling. 
The prospect of losing oneself upon hearing it or succumbing to immediate demise is unsettling. Thus, Lumian punctuated his reading to safeguard his mental well-being from plummeting to precarious thresholds. After poring through descriptions of approximately 30 to 40 spirit world creatures, Lumian stumbled upon a figure he recognized. Rabbit of Knowledge Weak spirit world creature, friendly to humans and possesses an innate thirst for knowledge, their summons are rarely declined. Diverse experiences yield distinct rabbits of knowledge. Shared traits include mastery of various languages, spoken and written communication skills, and adept reading capabilities. Extracting salient information from extensive knowledge is their forte, and their transcription speed outpaces even mechanical typewriters. Drawback, limited communication finesse and inflexible thinking. Some rabbits of knowledge have been tainted by anomalous knowledge, evolving into significant hazards. To summon, restrict choices to the friendly and weak. So, it goes by the name, Rabbit of Knowledge. Summoning this entity in the future should be more targeted. Yet, its abilities and attributes are of limited value. If I had gone as per Auror's vision of university enrollment, I would benefit from its multilingual proficiency and strong reading skills. Noteworthy, the text omits mention of its speed within the spirit realm, implying its negligible worth in that aspect. It moves sluggishly, drains spirituality. Lumian lowered the document, massaged his temples, and embarked on his third respite. During this juncture, the messenger bore Madame Magician's response. I share curiosity regarding what encounter the lad named Ludwig would bring. His appearance in Trier intrigues me, motivations remain nebulous. Vigilance is prudent, his existence carries intrigue. Proceed, the window of acting presents itself to me as well. Can't you people make things clear? Lumian's lips twitched, absorbing the succinct message. However, a nuanced sense emerged that Madame Magician's opening sentence wasn't an immediate response. It resonated more as a condensed echo of her contemplations. In essence, Madame Magician, imbued with her astromancy prowess, struggled to glean Ludwig's fate. Her perceptions seemed clouded, suggesting she only harbored conjectures. The obscurity surrounding Ludwig's destiny, evident in her inability to perceive it, spoke volumes. At 10.50 p.m. at Riss Docks, outside Warehouse 3. Lumian took cover in the shadows, poised to seize the much-anticipated opening for action. Soon enough, two silhouettes approached Warehouse 3, drawing within a mere five to six meters of Lumian. One of them spoke hushedly, riddled with concern, Hector, the accountants arrive tomorrow for an audit. How do we address this? Shall I hire a thief to pilfer the account records? What purpose would that serve? The moment they inspect the warehouse, suspicion will arise. Our remaining stock barely equals a tenth of the required amount. Hector's tone escalated, simmering with intensity. If we're to proceed, we ought to do so comprehensively by reducing the warehouse to ashes. This way, any discrepancies would remain concealed. I see, listening closely, Lumian deduced his cue to act. As his companion wavered, Hector interjected, Fires are commonplace in Trier, normalized in everyone's mind. Moreover, igniting them ourselves isn't necessary. The market district swarms with miscreants and rogues. Once the time is ripe, we can entice them to vacate Trier with a handsome fee. Honoré, we can't wait any longer. You must decide now. Honoré paused, then spoke resolutely, agreed. We'll locate Guy and recruit him into our plan. The duo conducted a swift survey of the warehouse's surroundings before departing for the docks, en route to rendezvous with their comrade, Guy. After a brief trek, the sky abruptly reddened, casting an incandescent hue across the scene. Simultaneously, the crackle of flames resounded. Honoré and Hector instinctively spun around, bearing witness to an inferno emerging. Vermilion flames surged, fierce and ravenous, soaring to engulf the structure. Fire, fire, Hector mumbled, a glint of realization dawning. Indeed, fire, praise the sun, it's a fire. Honoré exhibited a similar reaction, his right hand tracing a triangular sacred emblem over his chest, lips moving in muted invocation. 
yet, within the momentary elation, disquiet brewed within Honoré's senses. Trepidation tinted his voice as he discerned, The warehouse is in a flame, it's our office. Position meters away from the warehouse was their office a modest gray two-story edifice. The expanse separating it from the warehouse remained empty, devoid of combustible material. Hector's visage contorted in terror. Clenching his jaw, he spoke with grim resolve, We must set fire to the warehouse now. Even as the words left his lips, an explosion erupted from the locus of crimson flames. Though not seismic, the detonation garnered the attention of dock workers and firefighters. Fire! Fire! The clamor resounded as responders converged. In Trier, a city renowned for frequent conflagrations, firefighters were seasoned in addressing such crises. Observing the scene, Hector and Honoré, who hadn't reached Warehouse 3, slumped onto the roadside, their vigor sapped. At the entrance of the dock, Albus, his hair now a fiery hue, averted his gaze from the raging blaze to the middle-aged man at his side. Monsieur Guy, your colleague seems even more agitated than you. Guy's complexion paled as he shook his head in bewilderment. The warehouse wasn't the target of the fire. A pause lingered before Albus sneered. I warned you already. Hesitation begets mishaps. Now, ponder your escape. May you be more decisive this time. Beside the unassuming two-story structure, Lumian gazed upon the soaring flames. The timber and flammable materials metamorphosed into an ephemeral dragon, casting his countenance in fiery red, eyes alight with fervor. With a grin, he advanced toward the blaze. The duo's intent to commit arson entailed erasing incriminating evidence by reducing the warehouse to ashes. However, Lumian's purpose was to generate turmoil, inviting scrutiny that would unearth the discrepancies within the warehouse. Such was the duty of a responsible citizen. A mantle of flames enveloped Lumian, adhering to his attire obediently merely a hair's breadth from ignition. Donning the flaming cloak, Lumian marched into the roaring blaze. Fire coalesced with fire repelling smoke. Effortlessly traversing the structure, Lumian exited on the opposite end of the dock. Following the arson, Lumian acquired a rudimentary mastery over the potion's powers. He tamed it, dispelling the burning sensation on his skin and the trepidation in his heart. While his potion digestion remained incomplete, Lumian had already adapted to his present state, giving him the capacity to receive an additional inevitability boon. After carrying out a few rounds of anti-tracking, Lumian returned to the safe house on Rue des Blouses Blanches, initiating the initial step of digesting the pyromaniac potion prior to tracking down the padre filled him with satisfaction. He maintained a smile, yet his demeanor faltered upon glimpsing the towering pile of dense information within the iron cabinet. It would take at least a month or two to finish reading them. How could he identify an apt contracted creature in so brief a span? Chapter 313 Plans with Different Styles Lumian stood before the iron cabinet, his mind immersed in contemplation. With just a handful of days remaining until the date designated by the prophecy spell, Lumian earnestly aspired to secure contractee status, thereby attaining three distinctive abilities. This enhancement was imperative prior to pursuing Guillaume Bainet the augmentation would tip the odds in his favor. Relying solely on Pyromaniac, even in collaboration with Franca, now a demoness of pleasure, and the support of Anthony Reed and Jenna, prevailing against the Padre's uncanny abilities remained tenuous. Victory might be attainable, but apprehending the adversary without incurring losses was a near-impossible endeavor, except if he enlisted the assistance of the Aurora Order Oracle via Mr. Tain's K's finger. This assessment solely considered Guillaume Bainet as Lumian's adversary. If the Padre had other confederates, alongside a cohort of bestowers or bayonders, and if he had grown mightier than his state upon departing Cordu, Lumian's undertaking wouldn't assure triumph even with Mr. K. Lumian's aspiration was to pinpoint the Padre's whereabouts and engineer a snare, drawing him out. Such an approach would markedly simplify the process. Nevertheless, Lumian needed to bolster his strength substantially. Otherwise, the fishing operation would entail dire jeopardy. 
as Lumian perused the stack of dense information concerning spirit world entities, his mind world, seeking avenues to locate a suitable contract partner within a constrained time frame. Should I designate a time frame for reading and strive to cover as much ground as feasible? Then my selection must derive from my existing familiarity. This proposition falls short of my expectations. It risks bypassing the most fitting opportunity. Although the circumstances aren't optimal, I must reconcile with reality. Perfection remains elusive. I must confront my own limitations head-on. Son of a so, it hasn't reached a juncture necessitating blind acceptance. For now, I'll withhold any definitive moves until I ascertain the Padre's whereabouts next week. I'll bide my time. Following the completion of this information assimilation, a comprehensive strategy will crystallize, right? It will take approximately a month. The potential for accidents looms large. Uh, the rabbit of knowledge appears to have the ability to read and extract key points. Can I summon one to help me read the information and extract the keywords of every spirit world creature, like when I whistleblowed? Then I'll carefully study the corresponding spirit world creatures based on the keywords. It's a creature of the spirit world to begin with. Having come into contact with such knowledge, it will definitely be less affected than me and can last longer. Lumian gradually grew excited. The more he thought about it, the more he felt that it was feasible to ask the rabbit of knowledge to help him do the reading and write a brief summary. He swiftly perfected the corresponding plan. That rabbit is quite stupid and silly. I have to design a table in advance and list the page number, strength, whether it's friendly, brief description of abilities and points of characteristics. I'll let it fill in the columns in step and order. Unfortunately, a person can only summon one rabbit of knowledge at a time. Otherwise, if I had 10 or 20, I will be able to complete the summary on spirit world creatures before dawn. If one person can only summon one, what about having more than one person? I can have Franca, Jenna, and Anthony read summon one each for me. All rabbits can read quickly, extract essential points, and fill out summaries. Humans can do the same. Franca, Jenna, and Anthony can help browse through the information and quickly extract keywords from the columns. I'll contribute knowledge, and they contribute labor, spirituality, and time. Lumian's eyes grew brighter and brighter. He felt that if he pushed this plan forward, even with frequent breaks to mentally recover and the time to summon a rabbit of knowledge again, he should be able to produce a summary on the spirit world creatures in 12 hours. When the time came, he would browse through the summaries that wouldn't affect his mind and select 20 to 30 suitable ones. He would read the raw information in a targeted fashion and make a final decision. The only problem now was that the information on these spirit world creatures had been provided by Madame Magician. Lumian hadn't exchanged it using contributions or money. He believed that before sharing with others, he had to obtain the approval of the major arcana cardholder. This was basic respect. Lumian sprang into action without hesitation. Swiftly, he composed a letter outlining his inquiry and the comprehensive plan he had crafted. Soon, Madame Magician responded. For a moment, I don't know what to say about your idea. It appears you possess an aptitude for such considerations. Sharing your knowledge with your friends is permissible, but remember to advise them against engaging with powerful or perilous spirit world creatures. These entities hold no sway over you, thanks to Mr. Fool's seal. It serves as a deterrent in the spirit world, offering you a measure of protection that others lack. Actually, there are simpler and easier ways. Take the information to Two of Cups and spread it in every corner of the room. Then get Two of Cups to recite the divination statement repeatedly and throw out three tarot cards or three coins. Choose whichever spirit world creature they land on. Even if it's not the most suitable for you, it's relatively suitable. It might be useful in a future occasion. Hiss, what a brilliant charlatan! Madame Magician is indeed skilled in divination. Her style is completely different from mine. Lumian hadn't considered divination. After careful consideration, he decided to follow his plan. The answer chosen through divination always felt unreliable and unreal. He subconsciously didn't want to rely on it. 
By relying on his own intelligence and abilities to filter them out, he would feel more confident and convinced. Unless there was no other way, Lumian hoped to finish reading the information before making a choice. He burned Madame Magician's reply and carefully wrote up the form. For the time being, he only made five copies. Immediately after, he set up the altar to see if he could accurately summon the Rabbit of Knowledge. To this end, the summoning incantation he had devised was Rabbit-shaped spirit wandering in the void, a friendly creature that can be communicated with, a weakling who pursues knowledge. The choice to avoid using the human-coined Rabbit of Knowledge, as its name spoke of Lumian's respect for the enigmatic nature of these creatures. Having carefully considered his approach, Lumian ignited a solitary candle and made a summoning in his own name. His incantation concluded, and the candle's flame transformed into a deep shade of green, expanding to resemble a human head in size. From within the luminous green flame, a translucent creature emerged, its appearance reminiscent of an amusingly awkward rabbit. Relief washed over Lumian as the ritual proved successful. The creature's presence signaled a triumph, and Lumian's experienced voice addressed it, I wish to share knowledge with you, seeking your assistance in distilling key points and completing a form. The rabbit's eyes brightened, and in a tone that mimicked Lumian's voice and Trier's Intision accent, it inquired, Where is the knowledge? This was the first time Lumian had heard such a creature speak. He didn't expect it to imitate his tone and pronunciation. With purpose, Lumian retrieved a stack of information about spirit world creatures he had yet to delve into. He gestured towards the form on the table, articulating the task's parameters in a manner befitting a creature of limited intellect. The rabbit absorbed Lumian's guidance, its long ears drooping as it committed the instructions to memory. Eventually, it nodded in comprehension. Seated at Lumian's desk, the rabbit's eyes sparkled as it engaged with the information. Lumian noted with satisfaction that, despite its unwilling nature, the rabbit demonstrated proficiency in its repetitive task. It diligently extracted pertinent details and methodically filled out the form with words like powerful and dangerous. Although it's not very smart, doing such repetitive work isn't a problem for it. It's at least twice as fast as my reading. Lumian nodded in satisfaction and lay on the bed, preparing to close his eyes and rest while the rabbit of knowledge was busy working to alleviate his fatigue. After an unknown period of time, he suddenly sensed danger and hurriedly sat up. He saw that the transparent rabbit had grown to two meters tall, constantly flipping through the information and extracting. Stop! Lumian didn't understand what was happening and instinctively stopped the other party from coming into contact with the knowledge. The rabbit turned its head, its eyes bloodshot. After staring at Lumian for a few seconds, it reluctantly halted its work. Lumian's introspection led him to deduce the cause behind this transformation. As a creature of the spirit world, the rabbit of knowledge was similarly affected by that knowledge, albeit to a relatively mild extent. However, it wasn't like ordinary humans due to its lacking intelligence. It didn't know to stop and rest after an abnormality unless it directly endangered its life. As it accumulated, it inevitably underwent a certain mutation. Phew, it's useful that's true, but not having much intelligence is a huge problem. Lumian ended the summoning and allowed the rabbit of knowledge to return to the spirit world and slowly recover. He washed up briefly, lay on the bed, and prepared to rest. An idea surfaced just before sleep claimed him. Lumian summoned the rabbit once more and directed it to replicate a hundred copies of the form he had devised. Only then did he truly relax and fall asleep. The following morning, Lumian was brimming with vigor as he set off for Rue Anarchy. His first stop was to locate Anthony Reed, the information broker, and discuss the potential of his assistance. As he approached Auberge du Coq Doré, a figure emerged from a nearby side alley. It was Baron Brignais, adorned in a half-top hat and a formal black suit, mahogany-colored pipe in hand. I promise to catch up with you and express my gratitude for aiding me in finding Ludwig. Baron Brignais began with a smile. It's quite surprising to find you neither at Salle de Balbrise nor Auberge du Coq Doré. 
gratitude? Then help me read and write a summary, Lumian muttered subconsciously before swiftly dismissing the notion. Compared to Anthony Reed, an information broker with a mental illness, Baron Brignise was not only a member of the Savoy mob, but his background also seemed problematic. It was best not to let him discover that his relationship with Franca didn't rely solely on Jenna. A smile tugged at Lumian's lips. The night offers its own beauty. It's pointless to remain confined within one's room. How do you intend to express your gratitude? Rather than providing a direct answer, Baron Brignise diverted the conversation. I may not have mentioned this earlier, but I converted to the worship of the God of Knowledge and Wisdom a few years back. Chapter 314, Crowd Sourcing Did you communicate with your godson and come to me to confirm the situation? Lumian maintained his smile. What you believe has no bearing on me as long as you don't subscribe to an evil god. Furthermore, devotees of the god of knowledge and wisdom are not wanted criminals in Trier. His implication was clear, I'm still a wanted criminal, believe what you will. Baron Brignais had always been astute. He changed the subject and continued, Thank you for aiding me in locating Ludwig. I am unsure how to adequately express my gratitude. He refrained from specifying a thank you gift, hoping to gauge Lumian's stance and thoughts. Lumian pondered briefly before recalling the idea he had set aside. Getting Baron Brignais to assist with reading and summarizing didn't necessitate his presence alongside Franca, Jenna, and Anthony Reed. He could impart some information, clarify what he needed to focus on, and allow him to return home to peruse and transcribe. Likewise, before Anthony Reed committed to joining the pursuit of Padre Guillaume Bainet, direct contact with Jenna and Franca couldn't be allowed. An isolated office could be arranged for him at a later time. Lumian glanced at Baron Brignais and inquired deliberately, Are you proficient in reading and drafting notes? Auror's grimoires had denoted that the pathway under the Church of the God of Knowledge and Wisdom was labeled Reader. This was also the title of Sequence 9 Potion. Sequence 8 was Student of Radiocination, and Sequence 7 was Detective. Given Baron Brignais rarely exhibited special abilities and mostly leveraged his exceptional intellect, above average combat skills, and sharp marksmanship to lead the Savoy mob, coupled with his present faith, Lumian speculated he was a bayonder of the reader path. From the potion's nomenclature alone, one could infer such an individual excelled in reading. Baron Brignais drew from his pipe and responded, in contrast to the illiterate, my reading and learning aptitude is rather commendable. He couldn't entirely fathom Seal's intentions, yet he suspected Seal was prying into his Bayonder pathway, and it wasn't confidential. Gardner Martin had long been privy to this. Lumian unveiled a genuine smile. Of late, I've acquired a trove of information concerning creatures from the spirit world. However, as you're aware you should be aware, correct? Delving into such knowledge extensively exerts a significant toll on the mind. As a bayonder of the hunter path, I shan't require this information for an extended period. Nevertheless, I wish to have access to the pertinent knowledge when necessity arises, without squandering precious time. Therefore, I intend to furnish you with a portion of the data. Kindly assist me in reading and extracting the key terms. Much akin to constructing an index for a library. Baron Brignais promptly grasped. He grinned and remarked, Truthfully, this would prove advantageous to me. That knowledge holds considerable value. Library Index As anticipated of an adherent of the God of Knowledge and Wisdom. How professional! Lumian rejoiced, sensing Baron Brignais was roughly on par with Anthony Reed combined with a rabbit of knowledge. Simultaneously, he harbored a cautious sentiment toward Baron Brignais, for instance, he would furnish this god of knowledge and wisdom follower with ten pages of information. He would peruse them in advance and jot down notes. Subsequently, he would cross-reference them with the index submitted by Baron Brignais to discern any deliberate omissions or alterations. Of course, this was Lumian's unrefined approach. He could alternatively beseech Franca to verify via divination, but the potential for interference still existed. 
Lumian slid his hands into his pockets and surveyed Baron Brignais, akin to an artisan observing a laborer. He beamed and uttered, I'm indifferent to who benefits, as long as I accomplish my objective. Baron Brignais nodded faintly, refraining from further commentary. He solely apprised Lumian of his whereabouts the following morning and requested the information to be conveyed there. Auberge du Coq Doré, Room 305 Facing Anthony Reed, Lumian eased back and reiterated his words to Baron Brignais. Concluding, he voiced, This knowledge serves as your compensation. Furthermore, I shall impart to you the knowledge of ritualistic magic. You'll be able to summon a unique spirit world creature to peruse the information alongside you and distill the essential points. How does that proposition strike you? Are you inclined to accept this assignment? Anthony Reed's deep brown eyes mirrored Lumian's form as he contemplated and responded, You're pressed for time. This matter bears added weight for you. It carries great significance. Lumian had no intention of concealing this. He seized the opportunity and conveyed, I'm confronted with the need to face a formidable adversary soon, and I seek to secure a fitting contracted creature. When the moment arrives, I might extend you an invitation, primarily in a supportive role. You can consider whether to agree and what form of compensation you desire. Ha <laughs> ha, there's no rush for an answer. Think over it for the next two days. You're paving the way for me to be mentally prepared and foster appropriate expectations. Anthony Reed deciphered Lumian's thoughts. Instantly, Lumian felt a twinge of embarrassment, but he was never one to blush easily. He maintained a composed smile and articulated, Can you not tell that being honest will put your life in danger? Anthony Reed offered a slight nod, affirming certain aspects prior to committing to aid in perusing the information and crafting the summary. On the second floor of Salle de Bal Bries, in the room adjacent to Lumian's quarters, Lumian surveyed Anthony Reed and the Rabbit of Knowledge seated in tandem, diligently sifting through the information and completing forms. He subtly nodded in relief. Once more, he reiterated the caution not to delve deeply into the spirit world creature knowledge marked as powerful and dangerous. Exiting the room, he entered the office at the corridor's end. Franca cozied up in Lumian's armchair, her red-booted feet propped on the desk's edge. Baffled and intrigued, she inquired, What exactly do you need our help with? Why are you being so mysterious? Jenna settled into the chair across from her, turning her body as her gaze drifted to the door. Lumian nonchalantly shut the door and recounted the scenario, elucidating his need to secure a contracted creature prior to confronting the Padre. Wouldn't a simple divination suffice? Franca pondered as she acquiesced to Lumian's entreaty, while Jenna simmered with curiosity about the spirit world creatures. Before long, Franca gazed up at the trio of rabbits of knowledge and Jenna, as well as Lumian, each absorbed in their respective tasks of poring over documents. Amusement laced her voice as she quipped, Why does this feel like a miniature workshop, and we're the toiling transcribers? Congratulations, your instincts are on point, Lumian retorted in jest, Am I not also perusing the information and completing forms? Franca mulled it over and conceded. She resumed her labors. And so, they persisted until well past 10 p.m., punctuating their efforts with numerous breaks meals, siestas, catnaps to mitigate the strain. Brief reprieves preceded the summoning of the rabbits of knowledge once more. Intermittently, during his short intervals, Lumian observed Franca, Jenna, Anthony Reed, and the quartet of rabbits of knowledge. He remained vigilant to prevent them from becoming too engrossed and to detect any anomalies they might experience. Jenner reached her threshold first. Having newly ascended to instigator, she hadn't fully acclimated to the potion's effects and was grappling with containing the surge of power. Her state was less than optimal. Anthony Reed followed suit. His psychological scars ran deep, rendering him susceptible to certain deviations. Lumian, Franca, and the seventh set of rabbits of knowledge soldiered on till the end. Baron Brignais concluded his task around 6 p.m. and delivered the documents and forms to the café. 
After dismissing the summons and seeing off the fatigued assistants, Lumian returned to the safe house on Rue des Blouses Blanches, arranging the forms in a neat stack. Perusing the papers briefly, he confirmed the general state of affairs. A sense of accomplishment swelled within him as he casually tossed the forms onto the table. The immediate selection wasn't on his agenda. His plan was to first establish a contractee status and sort out the specifics of the contract. Only afterward would he consult the index, thereby preventing the likelihood of stumbling upon a spirit world creature that matched his criteria in all respects but failed to meet the contract stipulations. Lumian rested for a spell before summoning a rabbit of knowledge and tasking it with duplicating two more forms. Storing the three indices separately, Lumian's weariness was palpable. The prospect of cleansing himself seemed distant as he tumbled onto the bed and surrendered to sleep. At 6 a.m., Lumian brimmed with vigor, showing no haste to descend underground, arrange an altar, and beseech for a boon. Instead, he engaged in his usual regimen, jogging, practicing boxing, and cultivating his mental equilibrium. By nearly 8 a.m. he stood before the doorway to room 207 at Auberge du Coq Doré, ingredients at the ready. After a brief internal debate, Lumian ultimately seized the carbide lamp, although he no longer required specialized illumination equipment. He was, in essence, a paragon of such abilities. His aspiration rested on his foe's initial assumption that he lacked night vision and was inept at generating light. In underground trier, within the quarry cavern that had once borne witness to inevitability linked rituals on several occasions. Lumian briefly tidied the dank, lightless setting, positioning a blood-infused candle upon the altar stone. Just as he concluded the sanctification of the ritual silver dagger and readied to cast a spiritual barrier, faint footfalls reached his ears. The sounds reverberated within the subterranean passage, seemingly not distant from the present mine. Someone is passing by. Lumian's pulse quickened, his intent fixated on swiftly restoring the area to order and concealing himself. Yet, as he neared the altar before him, and before he could extinguish the carbide lamp, soft footsteps drew close, manifesting at the cave entrance. Aware that concealment was futile, Lumian promptly swiveled around, one hand nestled in his pocket, his gaze converging on the source of the sound. A slender man of brownish-black complexion stood there, clutching a carbide lamp. His black hair bore a slight curl, and his eyes held a profound allure. He sported a black seer's cloak reminiscent of those seen in a circus. Monet, Lumian recognized the figure. He was an islander swindler who had duped Charlie and been hoodwinked by the con artists in Sal de Ball Unique. Monette, too, saw Lumian. A smirk tugged at the corners of his lips as he greeted with palpable cheer. What a coincidence. In tandem with his words, the swindler produced a crystalline monocle, inserting it into his right eye socket. Chapter 315. Anxious Termiboros. What a coincidence. Lumian knew better than to consider it mere coincidence. Deep within the expansive underground of Trier, unexpected encounters were not uncommon, given the diverse cast of characters that frequented its depths quarry police, smugglers, cave adventurers, mineral researchers, wandering university students, members of secret organizations, wanted criminals, mobsters, heretics, and anti-government militants were active here. However, the odds of stumbling upon familiar faces in such a dark domain were almost negligible. This wasn't like the time he had rescued Jenna Lumian had doggedly followed the trail. Monette's presence, monocle affixed, roused Lumian's caution. He mustered a semblance of a smile and replied, Indeed, what a coincidence. With one hand casually slipped into his pocket, Lumian played his role, pretending to secure the candles and materials on the stone surface. The intention was to convey that the ritual was complete and he could depart whenever he pleased there was nothing of value to plunder or destroy. Monette adjusted his monocle and with a wave of his hand offered a departing smile. See you above ground. And just like that he withdrew, his footsteps fading into the depths. Lumian was caught off guard. He's leaving just like that? Could it really have been a coincidence?
Judging from Monet's familiarity with underground Trier, it is evident he has traversed these passages countless times. Yet, that level of familiarity should have taught him that barging into a well-lit spot amidst the darkness could easily trigger conflict. Common sense dictates that a stranger's presence in the quarry cave warrants cautious observation for any approach. The abrupt, nonchalant appearance seemed off. Does he truly possess that much confidence in his prowess? It can't be just to scare me. As Lumian's thoughts raced, he shifted his gaze from the cave entrance to the candles and materials neatly arranged on the rocks. The question arose whether to persist with the boon ritual. In that instant, the voice of Termiburos reverberated within him, you'd best relocate. A Lumian's senses tingled, catching a note of unease in Termiburos's tone. It was subtle, almost elusive, making Lumian doubt his judgment. This was the first time Lumian had perceived emotional fluctuations in this inevitability angel. In previous interactions, no matter how much Lumian goaded and prodded, Termiburos merely maintained silence. And yet, something about this encounter had stirred anxiety and apprehension within the angel. As his heart quickened, Lumian blurted out, Is this person truly dangerous? He isn't inherently dangerous, but I sense a looming threat, Termiburos responded. This confirmed Lumian's guess. The angel had sensed a looming problem through the strings of fate, a predicament that could jeopardize his very essence. Why does a seemingly less formidable individual trigger such unease? What's his motive? Lumian pressed on. Termiburos reverted to his usual depth as he intoned, I'm sealed. I can only perceive the outside world through you, so I lack ample information. To uncover the answers to these queries, the seal must first be weakened. Do I look like an idiot to you? I even suspect that your anxiety and worry might be fabricated to exert pressure and intimidate. But given Termiburos's previous conduct, even if progress hadn't been made, such overt intentions should not have been revealed so swiftly. Monet's appearance was indeed oddly coincidental, his actions shrouded in inexplicable bizarreness. If possible, I must evade him. It's safer to assume he poses considerable danger rather than underestimate and expose myself. With a brisk pace, Lumian gathered his belongings, clutched the carbide lamp, and exited the quarry cave. Drawing upon the subterranean map meticulously memorized from Gardner Martin's records, Lumian navigated closer to Quartier de la Cathedrale commemorative, discreetly delving a few meters below ground level to stumble upon another somber, soundless quarry cave. He incorporated no fewer than three evasive maneuvers along the way to evade potential trackers. Few, exhaling a breath of relief, Lumian surveyed his surroundings and rested his carbide lamp upon the ground. On a moderately level rock, he arranged the candles and ritual components, ensuring their proper alignment. Abruptly, a flicker of motion in the shadows at the quarry's edge pricked his senses. Hiss! Lumian's heart skipped a beat. Clasping the carbide lamp cautiously, he directed its beam toward the source. A bluish-yellow radiance pierced the obscurity, unveiling a black rat partially concealed by gravel. The rat made no effort to evade the light, it stood still. After a few heartbeats, it pivoted languidly and vanished into a minuscule crevice at the rock wall's base. For some reason, Lumian sensed a disproportion between the rat's right and left eyes. Gripping the carbide lamp, tension once again coursed through Lumian. He hushed. Temiburos, is there a problem here too? Termiburos's voice resonated within Lumian's being, emanating a regal aura. It's best if you pray to the fool immediately for angelic protection before moving elsewhere. Could the situation be that grave? Lumian's pupils dilated. Swiftly producing an additional candle, he hastily constructed the altar. Not a shred of concern lingered regarding Termibros potentially manipulating him into a detrimental choice. After all, supplicating the fool was Lumian's last resort, and it undeniably served his interests. From a different vantage, the very fact that circumstances compelled an inevitability angel to indirectly beseech the fool's protection implied that something far amiss was afoot. Unleashed, the peril would prove unfathomable. 
Being both mentally and physically optimal, Lumion's adept hands fashioned the candles, a process lasting just over ten seconds. He sanctified the dagger and forged a wall of spirituality that enshrouded solely him and the altar. Methodically, he ignited the three candles sequentially, from deity to humanity, from left to right, punctuating with drops of essential oil and extract. Amidst the haze and wisps of fog, Lumion exhaled, reciting gravely, the fool that doesn't belong to this era, the mysterious ruler above the gray fog, the king of yellow and black who wields good luck. I implore you. I implore your protection. As the ritual unfolded, Lumion surrendered to the mist's embrace, the prickle of his skin, the lassitude of his mind. Once more, he glimpsed the twelve-winged seraph, pure luminescence descending from infinite heights to envelop him. As the radiant wings receded and dissolved, Lumion's senses jolted back to him. Gauging his state, he hastened to pack up the altar items and hastily exited the mine's confines. Descending beneath the bustling market district, Lumion maintained his vigilant, practiced evasiveness, pushing forward with meticulous attention. Almost twenty minutes elapsed before Lumion stumbled upon another concealed quarry cave, secured by its discreet location, courtesy of his map. Stepping inside, he assessed the surroundings. His voice hushed, he inquired, Temiboros, is there any issue here? Presently none, Termiboros responded. Lumion shut his eyes, a newfound calm settling over him. He mulled over his options. Should I surface and await the anomaly's dissipation before seeking out a secluded haven for the boon-praying ritual? Or should I seize the moment, briefly escape the abnormality, and hasten my progression to Contracti, capitalizing on the fool's angelic protection? In keeping with Lumion's disposition, he leaned towards the risk. The scenario wouldn't change later. He couldn't ascertain if the anomaly had genuinely dissipated. He needed the counsel of someone higher in rank. In that case, he might as well seek that counsel now. The altar was reinstated. Yet this time he bypassed protection or boons, summoning instead Madame Magician's messenger. The doll messenger, clad in a gown of light gold, coalesced above the flickering candle flame. Observing Lumion, it grumbled, This isn't a good place. With that, it retrieved the hastily inscribed letter from Lumion's hand. The letter briefly recounted Monette's behavior and Termiboros's response, querying the possibility of initiating the boon prayer ritual at present. Lumion exercised some cunning here. He didn't outright solicit Madame Magician's protection, merely inquired about feasibility. Hiring a demigod came at a steep price. Lumion deemed it currently unaffordable. Instead, he aimed to draw her attention by inquiring. Of course, if push came to shove, he'd consider it. Debts could be repaid. Or if the person was deceased, repayment became moot. This isn't a good place. Does this pertain to the current quarry cave or the entirety of underground trier? Lumion contemplated the messenger's words. Swiftly, the messenger returned, bearing Madame Magician's response. That's a big problem. Madame Magician's opening remark twitched Lumion's eyelids. Of course, the situation isn't dire at least, I haven't discovered the gravest entity's return to this world yet. What we must ascertain is his true intent. Termiboros's reaction implies he's the target, but this individual excels at concealing motives. This may well be a calculated illusion meant to deceive us or another party. For the time being and the foreseeable future, anomalies should be absent. Stabilize yourself and proceed with the boon prayer. His? That's an angel? The entity whose hostility Monette exhibited is an angel. Lumion hissed involuntarily, engulfed by a renewed surge of trepidation. This brought to mind the uniqueness of Sal de Bal Unique. He suspected that confronting them to reclaim a debt might entangle him with a host of angelic blessed. Seeing Madame Magician's assessment align with Termiboros's, Lumion composed himself and reconfigured the altar. Before long, he focused on the pair of grey-white candles symbolizing inevitability power and himself. Amidst the intricate fragrance of grey-amber perfume, he retreated slightly and intoned deeply, Power of inevitability. You are the past, the present, and the future. You are the cause, the effect, and the process.